Well, we're back. It seems like uh, an eternity, John, but here we are back in uh, Bakewell Parish Church where we've been excluded for the best part of a year, year and a half going on, and now we're, we're back. And I've got uh, a question for you direct from, uh, from the Scriptures, from, from the words of Jesus, in fact, uh, who, who says in uh, John chapter 15, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Uh, rather more un uncompromising words than what perhaps what we're more familiar with is uh, the phrase being in the world, but not of the world. Well, I always found that verse rather comforting. I suppose I read it as a young man, thought about it. In our time of political correctness and, you know, the requirement for <laughs> equal rights for all, we, we're a bit sort of guarded about uh, hating pe other people. Even if we do inwardly, we, we, we don't often express it so openly as that. What we tend to do is ignore them. And uh, I've certainly felt ignored and uh, unappreciated for most of my life, almost all of it, apart from this rather extraordinary explosion of interest in the last few years on internet. Um, I've been coming here to the church to meditate for 24 years, believe it or not. <laughs> Night and morning, I've been coming up the hill to the church. <laughs> Yet, I've never really lost the sense that the church disapproves of me. <laughs> I'm certainly not. <laughs> You know, I'm certainly sort of very much on the fringes of the church and, and largely ignored by, um, by the... It's only really now that I'm <laughs> developed a following on YouTube that suddenly I'm, I'm, I'm of more interest. So uh, I, I understand this verse very well. And um, uh, all I can say is amen to that. It is so. I suppose if, 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 if we were in medieval days, I would long ago have been burnt at the stake or <laughs> killed as a heretic. <laughs> or even perhaps some, um, even longer ago, s strung up on a tree for my views. Um, and then something happens, the swing in fashion happens. You know, you, you might be surprised at that being one of the first organic farmers, how much I was laughed at by all my neighbours <laughs> laughed at me and thought I was nuts. And uh, well, one of the two more thoughtful ones said, well, maybe you've got something there, John. But uh, the vast majority just laughed or ignored me. The world swept by. Um, and then... Uh, you know, the pendulum swung and suddenly organic farm has become fashionable, hasn't it? And everybody jumping on the bandwagon. <laughs> There's money in it. Uh, and much the same has happened with meditation, which was a very alien thing when I started uh, uh, 65 years ago. And, um, no, 60, 60, 60 years ago. And, um, certainly regarded by the church with great suspicion. And uh, my, my father, for example, was very uh, suspicious of the, this Eastern stuff. In fact, right up to the day of his death, he talked of my mystical nonsense. <laughs> and my dear sister, who, who we suddenly, suddenly made friends after, after 80 years of, <laughs> of warring between us. Um, I remember she, she just couldn't bear me talking about meditation. I said, why can't I be just normal? <laughs> so, 
I know a lot about the hostility of the world. But, but, but can I say that the world hates you? Well, yes, I can, in a more specific and personal way. Because, uh, it's funny enough, an incident happened uh, just recently to me. Somebody I know very well got into what you might call a proper state. And, um, uh, and was there wrestling within herself with, with uh, um, problems of, uh, of money and, uh, and, and the pressures of life, past relationships and all these sort of things, all sort of crowded in at once. And, uh, and without, uh, I, I, I didn't get it right to start with. And, and I took a rather detached view of this. And, and, um, and of course, that's deeply offensive to someone who doesn't jump in and sympathize with your predicament. And, and hatred. When you're really dealing with these dark forces, and they are dark, my God, they're dark. I'm sure we all of us know this. Despair that completely overwhelms us. And to someone that, that appears unsympathetic, they're sort of rather detached, it can burst out in hatred, certainly it can. Again, I can think of another instance. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I'm rather a, a, a shy speaker, or I often just don't know what to say, and I tend to lapse into silence. And I remember another, another woman just exploding at me with absolute venom in her voice. Why can't you say something? Just sitting there with that silly smile on your face. Hmm? Why, why don't you get involved? Why can't you say something useful? I, I was so sh shaken to the core, you know, and the hatred in her, in her voice. And oh God, well, what have I done wrong? And, and only later, as I thought about it, I realised how offensive it is when someone's at peace in the midst. You know, th think of this present crisis in the news about all these pictures we're getting of these uh, frantic people at uh, Kabul Airport in Afghanistan. You know, to sort of stand in the centre of that in peace seems almost offensive, doesn't it? How can you just sit there like some sort of airy-fairy guru just being at peace in the midst of all this? Why don't you get up and do something? Do what? What can you do? <laughs> you see, you're, you're undermining people's belief in their, in their separate existence. We love our suffering. We just wallow in it. And someone that's, that looks and, and, and thinks it's not as real as it seems, it's, it's awful, isn't it? You, you, you hate them. How can, it, how, can you, how can you say it? It is real. This is what I'm struggling with. Look, look at poor me. I don't have the money. I haven't got any friends. How am I going to cope with this terrible situation? And all you can do is just look from a distance, sit there in the corner like a, maybe that's why the church gets cross with me. The church is struggling with how to pay its bills and how to sort out the world and look after the hungry and, and worry about, you know, whatever the latest political trouble is. And all I do is sit there day after day with my eyes closed like some statue meditating. Why does he do something useful for God's sake? You know, <laughs> That's as near to hatred <laughs> as you could get, isn't it? In this, in this sort of super civilized world we live in. So, yes, I think that those words are bang on. Absolutely. I want to tease out more what Jesus meant by saying, You, you are not of the world. Well, um, like it or lump it, we are, we are in the world. What does it mean to be not of the world? What does it mean to be not of the world?
to be asked questions like this about the words of Jesus, I, I hardly feel I'm in any way qualified to give an answer. And all I can really offer is my own experience and hope that may um, help to illustrate the, the point. I think back to my early days of a little child of seven sent to boarding school. I remember one of my school reports, the master wrote um, something about me being in a shell. It would be nice if I ever came out of it. Well, maybe it's taken me 80 years to come out of my shell. <laughs> oh, and all too easily I can shrink back into it, feel safe. <laughs> um, to be not of the world. Yes, I, I suppose the interests of the world, I, I just never really felt I was very much part of this world. I suppose I was, I loved the country, I loved my animals, but I never went along with the developing science, scientific farming, I always sort of hung on to the old ways. Always preferred horses to motor cars. I still do. <laughs> um, yes, the world swept by and rather left me out on the fringe of it, I think. But then I developed an early interest in. Uh, well, I didn't call it the mystical then, but but I suppose I might have done. Uh, I loved to 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 go out on the hills and. Uh, Loved the stars, loved silence. Was perfectly happy working alone in the fields. I never really liked going to pubs or company or parties, all this sort of thing. I'd rather, you know, I wasn't very comfortable in these situations. So I never really felt very much of the world. And then as I began to meditate in my early 20s, um, I began to discover this, this other world, the world of what I now call the spiritual world. And immediately that, that sort of, that beckoned to me in a way that attracted me. I just felt drawn to that, drawn to, I felt like a, if, if in this world I was a fish out of water, in the world of spirit, I felt like a fish in the water, in the right place. <laughs> and uh, and as, I, as I began to understand more about the significance of, of spiritual work, the work of prayer, and the real beneficial effect that spiritual consciousness can have upon the world, and I began to gradually discover what real work is and discover a real function for myself. A truly, not really comparably useful because it's infinitely the most useful of all works. But, but of course that's, that's all right for those who believe it, for the majority who don't. It's still, as my father would say, mystical nonsense. <laughs> Uh, some might say, John, that you were born with a natural disposition to be otherworldly, or not not of this world. So it's a, it's not really a fair comment to put it in a, a sort of a, a scriptural context, if I may probe you on that. You were naturally out of temperament and choice. Um, you were certainly not engaged in much of the world's activity, but that's just a, that's your 
personal temperament and human choice. What about the spiritual imperative? Jesus says he chose us out of the world. What does that really mean? Early on in life, um, I discovered the lives of the saints, of which there are quite a number of books written about all, all sorts of saints in different parts of the world. Often there's not very much is known about them, but uh, in some cases there is. But in all of them, uh, as far as I remember, there's, there's, there's uh, something about them being, being born with a sort of predisposition to spiritual work, to faith, to religion. Um, and now that I'm better known on the internet and that, uh, and I, I have opportunities to tell my own story, there are quite a number of people uh, um, communicate with me that, yes, I was much the same when I was young. I felt I never belonged in this world. Well, I, I feel, I, I don't feel a bit nervous to say I'm chosen. I, I wouldn't dare say that, really. But um, I'm more inclined to use that phrase of other people than myself. But. Uh, Well, why does it happen? I don't know. I can't explain it. But but some of us are just just in this position. We we like this, and why I don't know. It's certainly not my doing, is it? How? Why are we made the way we are? Who knows? God knows. <laughs> I think there are two polarities to this, uh, if I may say so. There's the, the sense of being called out of the world, but then there's the other dimension of, um, shall we say, normally you, you could say we are attracted to the things of this world. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. This is, uh, again, really uncompromising stuff and not very palatable to the modern ear. Yes, it's very black and white, isn't it? May I give an example of meditation? You know, when we start to meditate, there's always uh, two pulls, the pull of the mantra or whatever, we, wherever the method of meditation is, and, and the pull of the world, our mind, li likes to swing back onto our favourite subject, you know, whatever we're interested in, um, whatever we love, because we do love, most of us, our interests, our hobbies, our you know, family and all that, our work. I um, mean, it can persist throughout of one's lives, that, that, that one's sort of got a foot in both camps. That I'm not sure if we ever can really give ourselves 100% to it. Maybe we can when we're in times of utter despair. Yes, I think I have known times when, when I was in such despair that I just threw myself lock, stock and barrel into the arms of God jump off the cliff, yes, that's the way to describe it, into the ocean of love, total self-abandonment. With a bit more experience, it isn't absurd at all. It's the most completely logical thing to do. Um, it may seem absurd to someone that has so much experience of it. <laughs> um, but once you begin to realise that, that this is the, that this really is the ocean of love, <laughs> if that's what you want. <laughs> it can be 
And sometimes we, we usually try to love something of this world as well. <laughs> That's why it can be very useful. Ooh, in fact, one of the drawbacks to, for people who, who try to meditate is that we're usually not sufficiently unhappy. It's the really unhappy people who reach the pit of despair and often throw themselves the, more to, the most totally into, at God. And, uh, of course, that is... a spiritually speaking, the best thing we can do. Yes, usually we've we're got too much of a bit of a compromise about it. Love for the Father. See, what's that mean right here and now? You know, lot, we get a lot of visitors coming to Bakewell Church and, and we're just sitting on some really lovely marble mosaics in this part of the church. And many people come here and immediately their interest is taken by this. And they ask questions about it and wonder how it was made and where it came from and all that. Well, when people are doing that and then their interest is taken by these old wooden pews which are medieval, many of them, and uh, various carvings, the love of the Father, yet what is that? What is this presence, this still eternal presence here. The stillness that I've so often referred to. Now which is the Father? Is it these mosaics and the wooden carvings, lovely though they are? Or is it this infinite spirit? Unchanging infinite spirit which is actually the ocean of eternal life. See, this is, this probably puts it as clearly as anything. We can either be in this world of seeing and hearing the things of this world, which is really spiritual blindness and deafness, or we can open our insight and inner listening to this invisible and silent presence. Now one is the world of spirit, God, the Father. This is the world of matter. And we can't do both. Now, in meditation, we endeavour, at least to begin with, to let go our hold on the material. And by letting go, like a balloon, we rise into the invisible, silent world of spirit. Later on, we may be taken, which really means the end of our own efforts. It just happens naturally. We sit down and we just take an uplifted. Oh, God knows. And then, when we're taken up there, what happens to the world? It, drops, it completely drops out. It does no longer exist. It's like waking up from a dream. And the world is no more. This world passes away. So, John... Could you say then that love of the world is a bit like the sandbags, the heavy sandbags in a hot air balloon that just keeps you grounded and you just don't get up in the air and see the bigger view? Yes, exactly so. Yes, that's just how it is. But, you see, here let me, uh, let me enlarge a bit on what we mean by love of the world. Because, you see, there is... There are different aspects of love. I suppose you could vaguely call it pure and impure love. Now, normal love is a relationship between you as a separate individual and the object. There's another love. Think of it. This, think of this. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. To die for our sins. Now, 
if love for the world is translated into service, now then, we may say serve in the sense of going out to take meals to poor old people or something like this, in a sort of worldly service. But those of us called into spiritual service begin to realize it's all about raising consciousness, which is called by another name, prayer, the great work of prayer. Now, prayer is understanding the world, knowing exactly what happens in the world and the pitiful state of, of, of sin, which is absence from God and the cause of all our trouble, and, and doing the most effective thing we can possibly do about it, which is reconnecting with spirit putting it back in the context of spirit. In other words, by raising consciousness, that those that are attracted to that, those who one could say are called, will be drawn likewise. I remember once reading a lovely thing, and it out came from the east, if a butterfly flaps its wings, the whole world is affected. How much more by this by the work of raising consciousness. What is not affected? Think how the sun rises in the spring and every insect and plant in creation is moved, is uplifted too. Well, spiritual consciousness is even greater, isn't it? Take the phrase, almighty God. There's nothing more powerful than spirit and most merciful. Well, what is mercy? It's a response to need, isn't it? A respond it's love in response to need, to the needs of this world. The world cries out, have mercy on us sinners. And so we are raised. So there's another higher form of love, isn't there? Love of the world. Which is not what's in it for me. It sounds to me as though uh, an over love of the world as we know it can veer the plane off course, the hot air balloon off course to disaster. Is there, would you say, John, there's a, a virtue in keeping clear of the delights of this world, a sort of an ascetic approach, shall we say. So this question of the delights of this world, love, can we have pure love in this world? Well, I dare say we can completely unselfish love, divine love. Totally unselfish love. The great qualification is, you see, we, we talk of pure purity. What do we mean by purity? Purity is the absence of ego. I, me, mine, what's in it for me? It's unselfish. When you love for the sake of the beloved, when you give your life in service to the beloved, mother love, certainly to begin with, when a mother first holds her baby, is usually something pretty close to pure love, isn't that there? When you look at animals with their newborn young, not a thought for themselves, is it? They fight with all the lions in the world for the sake of that little floppy thing on beside it. <laughs> Give their lives for it without hesitation, wouldn't they?
This is not only in the human realm. Let's say yes. It's something to aspire to. Rather more prosaically, John, I wasn't thinking so much of sublime love, but rather more mundane things like uh, a nice coffee in a coffee shop and a piece of cake. <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, you once revealed to me that you have never bought yourself a whole parking cake, which is your favourite cake. I'm not sure that I can really explain it, <laughs> except that I was brought up by a mother who had known starvation in the days of the Russian Revolution. And I was born just before the war, so we lived in the time of quite severe food rationing. You know, Mother was so um, deeply affected by her own experiences as a child in Russia, young woman growing up there, seeing the terrible effects of starvation on her own family and on herself. And I remember how even if we left a few crumbs on our plates as children, Mother would eat them herself. She couldn't bear to, as a crumb should be wasted. She, uh, she always gave us whatever food there was and took the scraps for herself. That was how I was brought up. That's, that's how I think now. You know, I've never, I've never not felt this almost sacred nature of food and how wicked it is, to, what a, how wrong it is to waste a crumb. And then as a farmer, of course farmers are like that. An old saying about farmers are too mean to cut a piece of string. Well, that's 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 in, that's me to the to in a nutshell. <laughs> I wouldn't spend a penny. I wouldn't go and buy myself a bar of chocolates. It's just not in my nature to do that. I just don't. And this sort of um, you know, I would if I wanted to, but it, but the want the want the desire somehow isn't part of my thinking really. So, John, you have the, the benefit of many years' experience in this life. You say it's still a school. You hope to graduate to high school. So what, what advice would you have for younger people setting out on the path in, in regards to this being in the world but not of it with all its attractions? I think probably the most meaningful advice that was given to me is a as a young man agonizing over whether I should um, leave my father's business and uh, go out to South America to try to make the world a better place, was a, as a, an elderly French woman who said, you must follow your heart. Yes, I think that's it. That's as near as I've ever come to good advice to a young man. and. That's what I say to anybody that asks me. Follow your heart, what it is, where your heart is leading you. Now then, we may think we love wine and women and the good things of this life, but just, and of course we do, but ask yourself, what's really your deep heart's desire? Even deeper, what is what we love more than anything else? What really calls to us from our deepest inner heart? Many people express peace or freedom in some way how to be a better person, how to better serve the people and things we love. Now that voice is worth following. Don't worry.
worry about what the world says, don't worry about money, don't worry about position or anything like that. What the social convention is. Follow your heart, my dears. You may be a failure in this world, but you'll be in the right place. You'll come out okay in the end. This world comes to pass, but real things are eternal. Anyway, my friends, thank you for listening, and there's a bit of life in the old man yet, so <laughs> until another day, God bless you all.